Just most Londoners are winding down for the weekend, the younger generation is only now coming to life to rave. The rave scene has given new life to pirate broadcasting. Raves are no longer backstreet affairs, but have emerged as mainstream and now mostly legal entertainment for the young. Lucrative too. Everybody here has paid £10 to get in. We're off to the powerhouse. It's cool if they're having a night down here tonight. We're doing something there once a month. DJ Brocky is on his way to work to a rave sponsored by the pirate station Cool FM. Top pirate DJs like Brocky can earn hundreds of pounds a session, and there's no shortage of bookings. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. Yeah, good Friday. All right, mate. The music is called Jungle. It's produced electronically, but for dancing it's played on vinyl with a rap accompaniment. It's part of what's become a multi-billion pound dance music industry. But although most raves may now be legal, the government has stepped up its efforts to rid the airwaves of those most actively promoting them, the illegal radio pirates. For the pirates, the airwaves are an extension of the dance floor, taking the beat into the bedsits and tower blocks. Key figures in pirate broadcasting, like DJ Brocky, talk in almost missionary terms. It gives all the people on the street a chance to hear the music roar, like, you know, under, underground. It advertises the raves to them, you know, it gets them, it just, it just informs them exactly what is going on. Without the pirate radio, the rave scene would never thrive. DJ Brocky is on his way back from the rave to the radio station. Like other pirates, Cool FM regularly moves its studio to avoid detection. On condition of not revealing the location, we were taken to Cool's latest lair. Cool FM broadcasts some 70 hours a week, mainly at weekends. Every performance is an act of creation, mixing words and music. It's a two-way experience, though. Listeners in Charlton have asked for an on-air greeting. The call is taken by DJ Wildchild, who passes it on to the MC, who then shouts it over the music. That's the whole buzz of it. They can ring us up any time of the day they want. And you know, ask for a shout. If you're legal, you can't do that. You can do it, but it's all done properly. It's all one second break in it, so no one swears down the phone lines. Transmitting from around northeast London, Cool FM reaches beyond the M25 and claims thousands of listeners, like Nicky. I listen to Cool FM and Eruption FM because they're the best um, jungle station ground. Cool's the best out of all of them. I listen to Cool. Nicky and his mates are typical of the pirate station's audience. 15 and 16 year olds, they tune in at virtually every opportunity. Yeah, but how many hours are we talking about? Yeah, as long as we're awake. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're at a rave. You get the vibe what you might get from a rave. Bubble so you bubble at home in your bedroom or your kitchen, wherever you've got your radio. Not everyone can afford to go out every weekend. So having a pirate radio station is like having a rave at your house, really. Everyone doesn't like to go by the, by the books, in other words. People like to ring up a station knowing it's illegal. They like to go to a rave, you know, maybe it's not a, it's like they've got a license for the rave. You know what I mean? It's, it's part of you know, street culture to try you know, to do things illegal. But Big Brother is listening. The Radio Investigation Service comes under the Department of Trade and Industry, the DTI. Their 24-hour monitoring station outside Baldock covers the entire country. British broadcasting has traditionally been one of the most regulated in the world. Even listening to a pirate station is technically illegal. And it would be equally illegal for us to indicate the pirates' frequencies. The job of the Radio Investigation Service is to deal with the interference the pirates cause to those who are legal and licensed. We get complaints from people like the police, the fire, ambulance services, airports, all suffering from interference from pirate radio and indeed from uh, broadcasters themselves, uh, legitimate broadcasters uh, don't like the way that the pirates um, steal the airwaves and uh, take their audiences and advertising. We've had genuine cases of interference to uh, airport landing systems. 
I mean, how more serious can you get than that sort of radio interference? Any accidents ever resulted that you know of? Never any accidents on the aircraft side resulted, thank goodness. Uh, but my, but uh, really, these um, pirate transmitters are very, very close to airport frequencies. The DTI's boys on the beat operate in unmarked cars, using sophisticated signal locating gear. There's another pirate station there. On there. There's another one coming up here, which is quite a spread. That's causing quite a lot of problems there. These men are the government's electronic pest controllers. Their mission, to seek and destroy the pirates' equipment. To be effective, they have to keep the same hours as the pirates. We work generally on demand. Um, we work a standard nine to five, but we're always on permanent call, so 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we have been known to turn out Boxing Day and Christmas Day on, uh, if, when the need's been there. Tracking the pirates through their favourite terrain is a game of cat and mouse. And with its bigger, better whiskers, the DTI cat has the advantage. But that doesn't diminish the thrill of the chase. I have a certain sneaking admiration for their abilities. They, um, it is not easy to put on a program. Uh, it's not easy to transmit. It's not easy to build a transmitter. And they achieve it. Most of them, are, when you, if, should you ever meet them, are, are quite uh, normal people. Even if we've had them in court a number of times, they still invariably talk to them. We always try to shake hands at the end of any interview and leave like gentlemen. I think what it is now, this day, is they know most of the faces, bad as it sounds. They know who's who. They know most of the cars. There's lots of ways. You know, it's like, you know, they just sit outside and just watch. When they get a signal, so if they were to drive up here now and we were transmitting from there and they had a signal, they just, all they've got to do is just sit down and just watch and observe. Yeah, but your studio can be 20 miles away. Yeah, you? but all they've got to do is follow us then. Well, this was one of um, Cool FM's first... Um, output sites. This was our studio originally. That was our chill out room and that was the front room. This, this, this actual flat belonged to two of the DJs on the station. It was their own flat and they lost it through Cool FM. But it's raided? Yeah. One day we came back and it was all metalled up. We was here for about two years straight broadcasting every week in and week out. It's got a lot of memories this place man, believe me. It's one of the major places. This is where we had a major battle with the DTI. You know, we used to be all up there. That's where our area used to be from up there. And this is, this is just a major, another major spot for Cool FM and the jungle scene. The more canny pirates try to avoid the DTI by splitting their hardware between sites. The studio can be almost anywhere, but usually it's a flat or a bed set. It's linked by microwave to what's called a midpoint which in turn is linked often miles away to the rig, the transmitter, and with it, the aerial. You put your aerial on the highest point possible, like it would be one of these tool blocks here, and you transmit. That really, it sounds, it sounds quick and short, but that's, it's as simple as that. Cool FM have the experience and the expertise, but virtually anyone can set up a pirate station for as little as 500 pounds. This is a range of uh, part radio equipment. Uh, we start uh, here, which has got uh, the four cassettes, uh, soldered into the uh, middle there and that will keep going for quite some time and right underneath itself is the uh, transmitter. Crude but uh, effective. And then uh, moving up uh, the range this would uh, link a uh, studio with the uh, transmitter at a remote site. That's so a microwave link. That's a microwave link, what we call an LMB. And a more typical uh, transmitter that uh, we found fairly recently in London is this one. And uh, the point of having uh, this bolt in it is that uh, that's to try and stop us uh, getting away with it. But uh, inside here is uh, a much more powerful transmitter. Um, goes up to about two, three hundred watts and would uh, transmit across most of London. It's very frustrating at times when you know where a thing is, but you can't actually physically get to it because the street's blocked off because they've or they've put one of these farmers. Uh, bars in it that you can't get through and you have to end up going right, right the way around but fortunately uh, we're fairly knowledgeable of uh, South London so we tend to get round it. Everyone in the whole estate used to look out for each other. You get me, we have people that live in, friends that live in all different blocks. So the DTI came, we have friends would phone us and tell us that the DTI is in the area. Um, even down to the caretakers used to be on our side. They used to open up the, the, the shit lift shafts for us to put our rigs in, you know. The DTI men have considerable powers of confiscation. They can seize not only the pirates' equipment, but also their most valuable raw material, the music. We're not uh, killjoys, but uh, the records are very much a part of the pirate station. 
and our powers enable us to seize anything concerned with the transmission, including records, cellular telephones that run advertising for the stations. So anything that's connected with the station, we have the power to seize. And ultimately, I'm afraid those uh, things that we seize are destroyed. Both north and south of the Thames, the pirate broadcasters have carved out huge areas of London. For council housing managers like George Grime and Southwark, they're a headache. It's not just that they interfere with his tenants' radio reception, it's what they get up to on the roof. The main problem is the damage, trying to keep them out, trying to keep uh, tank rooms and uh, other um, areas on the roof secure. Um, because if, if the pirates get in, then other people can get in, children can get in, and, and all sorts of damage can, can be done in those areas. Um, another, another aspect of the problem is that um, if the person needs to get out onto the roof, often they're not very uh, careful about leaving the, the roof secure, and uh, pigeons can get into tank rooms with uh, 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 risk, the risk of pollution of the water supply in some cases. An estimated 30 to 40 pirate stations transmit across the southeast, and the numbers are growing despite the DTI's best efforts. Battersea is the home of one of the more youthful stations, but no less successful. My name's Kevin, this is Dream FM, and this is our studio. They know our station is one of the biggest in London, without a doubt. About a thousand of people we get at our events have done basically every big venue you can think of in London and we brand it. Ticket set up. You can say Dream of Fame and everyone knows Dream of Fame. Broadcasting from the piracy of their own bedroom, Dream FM specialise in music called Happy Hardcore. Like Cool FM, they carry ads and organise their own raves. Of all the pirates, they're aiming to be at the top. But would they want to be legal? Um, no, not really. Like I said, it's, um, you know, you're more, you're free to what you want to play, you know. You can yeah. pick up a record and you can pull it out of your bag. You don't have to pay royalties to anyone, you know. It's all sort of like free, you know. Come up, you do your slot. You play what you want to play, people ring up, they do their shout, what shout they want to do, rather than sort of dedication going out to requesting this. You know, it's more free, you can express yourself more. It's all very different from the pioneering days of Radio Caroline, when the few pirates there were modelled themselves on legal stations. Today, a bedroom is as good as a boat. And the political climate has changed. The 1990 Broadcasting Act heralded a new age of commercial radio, with supposedly more choice. So would the new licensing body, the Radio Authority, welcome today's pirates into the legal fold? It seems to me desirable that those who have an enthusiasm for radio, which after all we all have at the Radio Authority, those who have an enthusiasm for radio should be able to take advantage of the existing system, which is not a restrictive one. It has its rules, but it's not restrictive. KISS FM is the station the Radio Authority likes to hold up as an example. Evening listeners, you've got me, Kenny Ken up until 11 o'clock. Once a pirate station but now legal, KISS pulls in 1.2 million listeners a week across Greater London, mainly by playing mainstream dance music. Jungle gets a nighttime slot. The mix has worked so well that KISS is now completely controlled by one of the largest media groups, EMAP. Another brand new dub plate from V Records. Unlike the pirate days, those who run KISS now have to listen as much to the money men as to the audience. We have to make four million pounds before we earn one penny. I mean, that's, that's just how much it costs to run this kind of station. Um, hence, you know, that's imposed on us by sort of different bills, different costs, different, you know, just running a station of this size and with such a wide format. You have to start listening to the accountants or the financial directors. Um, yeah, you do. I mean, you've got to. I mean, it's, it's, and it, it becomes a business. It, it becomes a thing where it isn't driven by purely by that record that you played, which will make people go, yeah, that's great. It's by how many people are going to listen to that station um, and how you can convert them into advertising sales. KISS has to pay for a license to broadcast £80,000 a year. But while the Radio Authority preaches the gospel of diversity, it says licenses have to be rationed by the number of available frequencies. We are always looking for new frequencies and particularly looking for them in the London area where there is significant demand. We have identified a few frequencies that we will be advertising, one of which we have already advertised in South West London. 
over the coming months and years, but there really aren't very many. I mean, we've been very successful in shoehorning extra radio stations onto the air, but there is a limit. But some radio specialists argue there's still plenty of space that could be freed up. The trouble is, they say, that the legal stations have been given over-generous buffers either side of their frequencies. If you tune across the FM band, here we are in London, when you hear hiss, there's nothing there. There's, there's a station, there's some hiss, there's some more hiss. That's not interference. That's, that's not interference, that's a spare frequency for a low power service. And as you tune around, you come across quite a lot of hiss. Now, I'm not saying that all those frequencies could be used for London-wide services, but they could certainly be used for little local area services, maybe running 4 or 10 watts. At present, London has 18 legal stations. An additional pan-London frequency and three extra local ones will soon be put up for licence. But even then, commentators argue, that will still amount to about half the stations the capital could accommodate. Buried in the Times Square shopping complex of Sutton South London is the kind of station that's most likely to get a licence these days. Well run and well healed. Good weekend. Absolutely fantastic weekend. Good Eclipse morning. FM is owned by local businessmen and at present transmits only on cable. They now want to broadcast to a wider audience and have put in an application for the South West London FM licence. But to have even a chance, they have first to persuade the radio authority that there will be a demand for their service. And we've commissioned a very, very hefty uh, research document, which will hopefully give us an idea as to what our audience is at the moment and what our potential audience want from a, from a local service. Detailed in here are, are lists of support that we've, that we've got from local people who believe that what we're hoping to achieve is right for this area. That, that, also, that comes from the public, it comes from local businesses, government agencies, government offices, councillors. And that's not all. There's the application itself. It takes you uh, from the, the group of people who are involved in the station uh, at the start, but also, also now as well. It also takes you through uh, external assistance that you, you know, agencies or people that you've had to bring in to help with the application process. And then it takes you through the staff structure, uh, there's a very, very hefty um, section here that, that deals with programming. But the real cost is in the market research that has to be done before you can even put in the application. It's probably, at the end of the day, going to cost between 20, uh, 20, 40,000 pounds, between 20 and 40,000 pounds. And that's purely stake money. If you don't get the licence, then that's written off. You've it's, had it. Yeah, it's all lost. That's a, a lot of money, and it does seem to mean that only those people who have already got deep pockets can apply for a licence and get one. The other side of the coin is that the unsuccessful applicants have probably spent as much money and are then going away empty-handed, which seems a shame. Inevitably, it's the big corporations who have mopped up most of the London-wide licences. But now, even some insiders think the regulatory hurdles should be lowered to let in some small-scale niche stations. Now, the smaller the format, if you could actually decrease the amount of money that that station has to pay, which, you know, does happen at the moment, and you could take it down even more, then we'd all be on the pl same playing field, as in, we're all legalised, we're all out there fighting in the commercial world, and, you know, sort of, it's not us against them or whatever, you know, it's, it's just normal business. My name's Nicholas, they call me Nicky Slimting because I'm skinny, and I'm 16 years old. The hurdles put up by the authorities haven't stopped Nicky getting on his bike. Nicky is hoping to build a career in the new industry spawned by the pirate radio stations. He's just been voted by Cool FM as the best up-and-coming DJ. But the government's present attitude means his future will be as an outlaw if he's ever caught broadcasting on a pirate radio station. The, the aim of it is try to get this record in this, at the same time, put the beats at the same time as this one. So I'll get a beat on this tune, I'll hold the beat on this tune until I find the beat on that record. Nice, one, it's in. So I'll bring it in on the crossfader. And I'll try to hold this beat as one. And this is a mix. I want it to be a career. 
I want to make music as well and have my own record company. I just don't want to be involved in jungle, be involved in hip-hop, soul, R&B, everything, all type of music, make all different type of music, not just jungle. Because that don't make enough money just to be in jungle. I want to be worldwide. It's very important. It gives them a chance to, to, um, to um, try their talents out making music. Um, a, few, a few of my friends started off from their bedroom, and now they've got major deals with RCA, MCA, Virgin, you know, and that's through just, you know, starting off in their bedroom as a youth, but passing the records on to us as DJs. Even as an apprentice DJ, Nicky can earn £60 a session. He's made a DAT recording of some of his music and is off to see a man who could move him one more rung up the ladder. Yes, Nick. What's happening, right, man? You all right? Mm -hmm. What's going down? Nothing. You all right? I've got a DAT for you to listen to. For Nicky, DJ Ron is a role no, model. From raves to riches, Ron has made it. He now has his own record company. His label, London Something Records, is one of the most successful out of literally hundreds of labels currently on the dance music scene. At the moment, we've taken a long stretch out of it by getting all the samples in and whatever, and he's now got them on the keyboard. So this is what he's got at the moment. All right? I'm just going to record, record it in for him. I started off in a worse way. I had like just my mum's little turntable and just like a little switch. I was like just using one deck, like scratching and that type of thing. But the idea was pretty much the same. Like, you know, I was trying hard and working and DJing and it seemed like you're not making any progress and it's still kind of like doing it just for the love of the music. It was exactly the same. The next step is the cutting house where Nikki's tape is mixed onto a record for his DJ friends to play. In today's record industry, dance music like this comprises roughly half of all single sales and a quarter of all album sales. If Nicky's music catches on, he'll end up selling his records alongside the 60 other dance music discs released every week in a local record shop. In this case, back in the beating heart of Hackney. This shop specializes in jungle music. But jungle is only one of 55 separate categories in the dance music industry, from trip hop to handbag house. But it can be a precarious life. The link between the pirate stations and the music business has come to the notice of the DTI. In addition to the pirates, they're now targeting any record shop thought to be involved with them, like this one in Tottenham. Middle of 1994, I was sitting in the shop. Two gentlemen came into the shop. Uh, looked uh, a bit suspicious, they were wearing suits, didn't look like they were collectors at all or DJs. Introduced themselves as DTI officers and uh, mentioned to me that they had heard the name of the shop mentioned on a pirate radio station and do I have any connections with that station. A few weeks after that I received another visit from the same two DTI officers accompanied by a uniformed police officer who then told me that what I had, I had been doing was still uh, advertising. Now they put the word in advertising with a pirate radio station because my name had been mentioned again on the, the station as an, a ticket outlet for a fundraising dance. Robert Douglas ended up in court on five separate counts. The five were eventually reduced to a single charge, of which after six days in court, he was acquitted. Yeah, that's not a bad tune, actually. Have a listen to this. He's still trying to recover his £3,000 legal costs. The maximum prison sentence, because this carries a prison sentence, is two years. Uh, the maximum fine, I'm not too sure what, but I was told that in total I could have been out of pocket by between six and £10,000. What would that meant for your business? Uh, I would have closed. But the DTI's hard line is at odds with that sometimes taken by the local police. While the DTI prosecute record shops, the police apparently recognise the pirate status in the community and even drop in for the occasional guest appearance. Good evening to you, sir. Welcome again. Yeah, it's good to see you again, Dan. OK. This is a phone-in on race relations for a pirate outfit called Station FM, answering the questions an officer based in Stoke Newington. What about you as a policeman now? Do you see that friction that they're talking about? There, there is friction between police and the community, depending on what type 
person in the community we're dealing with. Some people out there have an awful lot of prejudice. The police's pragmatism underlines an uncomfortable truth for the authorities. Pirates like Dream FM have captured an audience and helped create an industry. The radio authority may in theory offer legality, but the pirates know the DTI is never far away. The station has gone off air. The suspicion is that the DTI have struck again. It's a 15 minute journey to the tower block transmitter to find out. It's been taken off quite a lot by the Department of Trade. As people know, it's a successful, uh, really good up and coming station like ourselves. It's hard to keep up with people nicking the rigs. But whatever the DTI has done, the pirates know that for £200, they can be back on the air tomorrow. The dilemma for the government is that the harder they hit them, the more the pirates' buccaneering image will be enhanced. Where are they? They've gone out. Must have left about three or four minutes ago, I'd say. Try again tomorrow. What happened? Cut the D-lock. Use the angle grinder. What's the D-lock? What's, 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 what's that for? Uh, it's a um, lock the rig in place. So it keeps it intact in place, so people, people can't take it. But DTI usually have equipment that is able to cut through our equipment, and that's why. How many minutes before do you reckon they came? Five minutes ago. They probably left about three minutes ago. Still warm. Still warm. Still warm. Cut, yeah. The metal chain. Yeah. Metal. yeah. Try again tomorrow. And um, how long do you reckon it will take you to get it operating again? Tomorrow. Morning. Hopefully. Morning. So about. Hopefully within eight hours we'll have some news. Again. How do you feel? Get on the uh, ferry guide. <laughs> yeah. Cold, yeah, get that resorted, isn't it? Yeah, another Got an event tomorrow. Come on. No good. I have to go and get another rig. Never mind. Next week on First Sight, 15 years after the Brixton riots, Tim Donovan reports on a change of tack in South London. <laughs>